Hello. Welcome to the second in a series of video reviews of uh, recent books in poetry that is linked to a series of poetry book reviews that I'm doing for the Poetry Foundation on their Harriet Books blog. My last video review was about uh, Threyal Muntasser's The Wild Fox of Yemen. And this one is going to be about another book that is also quite new. I believe it's just being released this month by Nath the poet Nathaniel Tarn. And it's called, I'll um, link to it in the comments, uh, it's called The Holder, Holder Linnae. So that word may not be very familiar to many of you, but but it's worth dwelling on a bit. It's, it's he um, uh, introduces, you could say, a new word, Tarn, into the um, English language. It's a reference to the German Romantic poet, Friedrich Holderlin. Here's a picture of him, Friedrich Holderlin, uh, who was born towards the end of the 18th century and lived a long but very tragic life uh, in the city of Tübingen. He was raised, Holderlin was raised to become a, to enter into the seminary, but that proved not to be a very good fit for him. Uh, he met a few of the most famous poets of his time, such as uh, Schiller and Goethe. Goethe was not very impressed by him, as he records, I believe, in his letters. Uh, Schiller tried to help him a little bit, but ultimately Holderlin didn't fit. He didn't fit into his society, even though he was very as influenced um, as these other poets were by the new currents of romanticism, um, his German was even more distinctive and unique. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really for this reason that it's, as, as, a, as a, his literary German, the German of his poetry is, is regarded now as being without parallel, but in its own time, it wasn't appreciated. It was, he was just seen to be very idiosyncratic and eccentric. And ultimately um, after the death of his beloved, a woman named Suzette Gontard, who, with whom he was having an affair, Holderlin went mad. He lost his sanity. He was forcibly confined to an insane asylum and where he did not stay for very long, he was released. And then a carpenter who, a, a local carpenter who respected his work <clears throat> invited him to stay with, to, to live with him, uh, because no, his family wouldn't, Holderlin's family wouldn't take him, wouldn't, wouldn't um, even take care of him. They preferred to have him institutionalized. So Holderlin spent the last four decades of his life in this car home of this carpenter um, his family. He didn't communicate with them. He wasn't really able to speak very well. Um, and he lived in isolation from the world. He did write a little bit, uh, uh, but it wasn't regarded as coherent, wasn't published. So that that's Holderlin's tragic life. And as often, as so often happens with really great poets, the ones that we, that are most central to our sense of what literature is and can be, uh, he was um, forgotten in his own time. He was completely dismissed. He was, people just thought he was dead. Although once in a while, um, there were the younger, the new generation of romantic po of poets made pilgrimages to the tower where Holderlin was um, residing. And there's one very famous chronicle biography of, 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 of a po by a poet who did make this pilgrimage. Uh, his name is uh, Wilhelm Weblinger, and it was published recently in a new edition. Uh, it's called Friedrich Holderlin, Life, Poetry, and Madness. Of course, it was originally written in German uh, during soon, I believe, uh, very soon after Holderlin's death. Uh, it was eyewitness account of what had become of this great poet who was also regarded as a madman. And um, I'll just read a very brief excerpt. I really highly recommend this book. It is published by Hesperus Press. It's a very quick read, less than 100 pages. Uh, translated by Will Stone. Um, yeah, so I, I won't go too much into this book and because the actual subject of the review is, is Nathaniel Tarn's The Holder of uh, But it just, it, it's important um, for you to have a sense of who Holderlin was, why he might be of interest to a contemporary work of American poetry. And I did notice, by the way, that there's basically nothing, certainly nothing in English on Holderlin on YouTube. 
So I thought it would be useful for me to introduce him a bit. Uh, so here's a this eyewitness account of Holder Lynn in the um, 18th century or 19th century, sorry, uh, secluded in his tower, in his madness. This is what his visitor notices, the, who is also a poet, by the way. Babeliger was a poet, not nearly as great as Holderlin, but he was very impressed by Holderlin and he wanted to learn from him. And he was distressed to see that he had um, lost his sanity. So um, the Babeliger writes, Countless times I have noted this unfortunate contrariness which consumes his thought, Holderlin's thought, even at the moment of its conception, since he customarily thinks out loud, Holderlin thinks out loud. As soon as he managed to hold a thought for some distance, it turned his head. Confusion redoubled. His brow was overcome with terrible nervous convulsions. He shook his head and would cry out, no, no. And to get clear of the dizziness caused by chronic anxiety, he would a few moments later let himself sink into the comforting balm of madness, firing out words without meaning or any signification, as if his spirit, in a sense overstretched by such a drawn out thought, could restore itself only by having his mouth issue words which bore no relation to any of it. So then the poet goes on uh, to describe his his condition um, and particularly with attention to his language. So he writes, uh, he tends to add a phrase which doubtless corresponds vaguely to the theme he wishes to develop. This phrase is clear and right, though it is more often than not a memory. But as soon as he begins to give it form, to elaborate, to engineer something which he tries to mine, the seam of the memories which remain to him and to give birth to some new thought, he loses purchase. Instead of a single thread connecting all his diverse thoughts, there exists a woven tangle of comings and goings like a spider's web. So the reason why that's worth dwelling on is because, a couple of reasons, uh, Holderlin's very distinctive, very, some might call it tortured poetics, uh, in a sense of the syntax is very kind of off kilter, very difficult to translate. Um, and this is a poetics, a, a poetry addiction that he wrote while he was considered sane, but people have connected the madness of his later life, which is also manifested linguistically with the strangeness of his earlier poetics and also his translations of, um, for example, um, uh, Empedocles, I believe, um, and Euripides. Um, these, they were not, they were, although they later attained, um, popularity in its time in the time time of their publication they were reviled and thought of as just too bizarre for a german readership so it, it you we can't just kind of dismiss the the madness of holderland's later years as saying that no that's not really relevant to his poetry or to world literature to his contribution to world literature because it actually seems to have been an element of his early writing and early thinking as well and so here's where um, Holderlin uh, and the Holderlinai by Nathaniel Tarn comes in. So that's just a Holderlinai is Latin plural of Holderlin's name. Of course, that's the invention of Nathaniel Tarn, but it's his way of performing an homage to this very great poet. And I, I just thought it was worth mentioning dwelling beginning, I should say, but with Holderlin's madness, because in the review, which I'll link to, uh, that was published uh, by the Poetry Foundation, um, I, I think it wasn't clear or it wasn't known to the readers, the initial readers of that review, that Holderlin was little, suffered from men severe mental illness. That this isn't something that was perhaps he's not known at all to an average uh, American uh, reader of poetry. But that's an important subtext to this collection by Nathaniel Tarn. I think it's it it Tarn is suggesting that that Holderlin has a, a very special way of seeing the world, a very special connection with the cosmos, not just with humanity. And so this these Holderlin I uh in this book, uh there are thirty poems that, that are each called the Holderlin I. It's but but the you can see in the first page of the book itself it just says um the A poem. So in other words, we can treat this as a kind of epic or an epic biography of the poet Friedrich Holderlin, an epic homage. The, uh, like Holderlin, who, who violated the rules of German syntax, so does Nathaniel Tarn violate the rules of 
English syntax. He mixes prose poetry with verse, even rhyming verse. Uh, some of the text here in this English American poem is translation from Holderlin's German. It's a very innovative kind of work and uh, very difficult to read. I won't pretend that it's that it's it's easy or pleasant. Uh, it isn't. Uh, but but I think it's it does justice to the poet himself to Holderlin um, through the way that it brings you into confrontation with your own mortality and with the cosmos. And I'll just read one very brief, uh, the last stanza of the first Holderlinite to kind of give you a taste of this book. Then I'll say a little bit about Nathaniel Tarn before I conclude. So I should also say that these these 30 Holderlinite, which are poems, including prose poems, it's a preface by a very useful biographical note on Holderlin's life that will tell you in different words, some of what I've already told you about Holderlin's difficult life. So here's the last stanza of the first Holderlin I. Among great hymns, odes, elegies, and fragments, he spoke it first, wrote of it first, meek writes der Lorbeer, ruhe big lukt meek nicht. And this is the translation. It is the laurel that I want, not peace and quiet. Singer of rivers reversing time, if there is a single drop of life left in this man, this man is being slowly murdered. It is because of him, become of him because he lived and died among the dying peoples, the deaf, the paralyzed, the gods. Death has a thousand cards to play, life only one. I love that ending because it really gives the reader a sense of the the miracle of existence and sometimes we think of death as being the kind of inevitable fate that greets us all but what the this last line suggests death has a thousand cards to play life only one is that death is what is random and life is kind of what you make of it there is a death even you could say in true german romantic fashion there's a destiny that awaits us all and that is what life gives us. So that just gives you a very brief uh, sense of these Holderlin poems. I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading it like from cover to cover. I think it's the kind of book that you you look at from, you know, maybe read one a day as a kind of al almost uh, like a spiritual meditation. Um, even if you don't believe in God, not necessary. But but I think that might be a good way to begin every day because it, these are very mystical poems about the cosmos, about death, about mortality, and about Holderlin and his madness. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that would be a satisfying way of reading these poems. Um, and then just uh, just to say a few things about Nathaniel Tarn and what drew me to this book. So like me, Nathaniel Tarn began his professional career as an anthropologist. He conducted research among the Native Americans of uh, New Mexico, where he actually lives now. And he was very interested in the, the links between poetics and anthropology and ethnography and the kind of way in which good poetry has a strong ethnographic imagination. It's not, it's about the outer world. It's about the worlds of cultures and peoples that we may not um, have been born into that aren't necessarily representative of ourselves. It's an encounter with otherness. That's something that really relates to me as well and to my poetics. And also um, Nathaniel Tarn, although he was very, very successful uh, in his professional career as an anthropologist, he left it ultimately because he felt that academia was just too stifling, too bureaucratic, could not really provide a space for him to truly be a creative writer. And then he worked in publishing for a while. He did part-time teaching, but really he's mostly lived his life as a recluse. Um, and has not, I, I kind of admire that, you know, he's not um, sought fame and fortune of any kind. He just lives in, in New Mexico and doesn't give a lot of interviews, uh, but his poems, and his poems are difficult and challenging, but he really pushes the reader to kind of think outside of their own space and time. So that's my latest recommendation of new poetry books. And also while I'm on the subject of Holderlin, I also want to conclude by recommending some books by and about Holderlin. So this probably perhaps the best translation that I'm familiar with of Holderlin is published in Princeton's library, Princeton, Li Princeton University Press's 
Lockhart Library of Poetry and Translation series. The translator is Richard Seaberth. His introduction is absolutely amazing. I really, I mean, it's, it's the beginning of my encounter with Holderlin. It's a brilliant introduction. And it's a bilingual edition of Holderlin's um, poems. So I would definitely recommend beginning with this. Another book I recommend is Holderlin's Essays and Letters, published by Penguin Classics. And this is a, it, it, it's a very moving read, at times difficult. Um, it's both, the, the, the letters are quite readable. The, some, of, some of Holderlin's essays are very philosophical. He's really influenced by Schiller. And, uh, and you could say prefigures Hegel in certain ways as well. Very well versed in philosophy and aesthetics and in Greek tragedy. And he's very original. You will not have encountered the ideas you're reading in Holderlin's essays elsewhere. Now, m many of the essays were not published in his lifetime. So they're fragments and they, they aren't finished. And so you kind of have to fill in the gaps often. It's not every, the implications of what he's saying are is not always spelled out. So that's one challenge. I hope you, this has uh, done a job of introducing you to Holderlin and inspiring you with, with Holderlin's poetry and also uh, made you want to learn more about Nathaniel Tarn. So stay tuned for the next review coming up in a few days.